Yeah, I'm from I'm from Indonesia. Indonesia, great. Yeah. Sebenzile from yeah from South America, uh, South Africa. Sorry. Gladys, where are you now in Washington D.C. or so? Kenya. Kenya, uh, but you're in Kenya right now. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay, Af Af Afshin. Afshin. Hello. Yes. Where are you now, right now? Hello, everybody. I'm from Iran. Iran. Okay, great. Yes. Uh, Diesa. Hi, I'm originally from Germany, but in New York at the moment. Okay, you want to say too, Jamie. Hi everyone, I'm from Chicago and uh, but currently in Wisconsin, which isn't too far. So. Okay, wonderful. Aida, you're from Slovenia, I guess. <laughs> Aida? No, I think you're muted or we don't see you. Okay, Molly from uh, India. Yeah. Johnny from uh, Switzerland. I have okay. my microphone. Hello, everybody, and greetings from Switzerland. Okay, great. And uh, is, we have a second screen or not? Yeah, okay. Well, I think I lost track. If I forgot everyone, I apologize about this, uh, but glad to see you all. And uh, as you can see, I think we are covering, uh, I guess, uh, all continents at least. And 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 for sure, uh, a lot of um, of different countries. So welcome, and uh, as Moria mentioned, it's uh, great to have you here. Uh, you know, during the month of August, when we know for a lot of countries, uh, this is uh, the the months where people take their holidays. So we appreciate for some of you, maybe that's not uh, the holiday season, but uh, glad to all have you here today. So. Um, Bef uh, before we get started, Moria, do you want to say any words or you want me to, uh, to get one started? One small request. Yes. Uh, one small request. Uh, I'll put down in our chat the link to our WhatsApp. So those who are not registered to our WhatsApp are jo uh, invited to join us uh, using the link that I've just attached. And Thank you. Um, yeah. I just want to say that that Vincent and I are working on additional lectures as well as additional deeper relations. So be prepared to a short survey and please help us uh, because together we can do more. Back to you. Thank you, Maria. So let me, I had just prepared a, a few slides on um... Uh, so we're glad to see, first of all, today a lot of, of new faces. So we are, uh, I think, based on our last count, we had more than 120 uh, participants who are um, joined this community. Not everyone is joining uh, all the time, but uh, it's glad that we have we were able to build this community quite rapidly because we have been uh, just starting this community maybe uh, six months ago. So glad to uh, to see that uh, we're getting some traction and people are, are um, I mean, find this uh, community uh, uh, valuable. So uh, again, I mean, this community, I mean, we, we started with some generic uh, objectives to get people interested in, uh, in research and in knowledge management together to, uh, to share their research in progress or their, their publication or or whatever research challenges they have in their organization. So uh, we welcome, um, I mean, academic, non-academics, anyone uh, who's interested uh, in some research aspect related to uh, to knowledge management. And we welcome, I mean, if some of you have, have some ideas on on what we could do, on how we could do uh, differently, we really welcome your, your feedback. As Moria mentioned, we will soon uh, launch a quick survey again we did one a few months back but we will do another one again to try to to find uh, affinities and uh, people who could potentially have similar interests and create subgroup of this large uh, research group community so to uh, get people more engaged in between the, the monthly uh, meeting sessions that we um, that we have 
So uh, Moria just shared through the um, WeChat, the uh, LinkedIn, the uh, WhatsApp group. Uh, you know, of course, you're, you're welcome to join. That's a way also to share in between sessions some information and, and to get a closer uh, community. We also have, uh, and uh, you may have received my email, our email recently, but if not, I will anyway send you a new one. Uh, we have a, a, um, a YouTube channel where we always record our, our, our session. So if you cannot join uh, I mean, physically or virtually for our session, uh, you can always watch them uh, later on. So uh, today's lecture or to, today's presentation will also be posted uh, probably uh, by the end of this uh, of this week. Okay, so without further ado, so I'm um, I'm delighted that uh, Bruce um, accepted to uh, to present his his uh, his research work today. So uh, I'm sure that um, all of you or most of you uh, may have heard about Bruce. Uh, Bruce through his uh, Real KM magazine. If you have never came across uh, Real KM magazine, you should all give it a, uh, a look. It's a, it's a free online KM magazine that have been around for a long time. And Bruce, you would be able to maybe to tell me, uh, to, to share with us from how many years it has been around, but real uh, great articles that are, uh, that are published in this uh, online uh, magazine, which is one of, I, I will, to my knowledge, probably the only one uh, left uh, free online KM magazine. So that's, uh, that's weekly. a great value. We, and weekly, weekly, and it's uh, weekly, weekly. Because weekly, we have uh, several additional form. ones, but that's the only really one that is uh, weekly. Yes. So uh, so Bruce, I mean, is, is not just the founder and the uh, editor-in-chief of, of this. Uh, Bruce has been involved also in a lot of uh, very exciting KM activities and KM research that... Uh, he will share with us uh, today. So, Bruce, uh, the floor is yours. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and uh, yeah, let us know if you need our help at any stage. But we are all here to to hear from you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vincent uh, and Moya, for the uh, introduction. I'll just share my uh, screen. Uh, sorry to interrupt just for how long uh, real KM has been uh, running has been online how many years now uh yeah actually since 2015 18th of august is the eighth anniversary of real KM magazine so uh okay. yeah so tomorrow i'll have a, a beer to uh, celebrate the eight years of of activity so uh, and actually, just in the in the early uh, slides of this presentation, I give uh, some statistics on uh, how many articles we've published and so on. So, oh, uh, yeah, so we're very, very okay. uh, excited by uh, by how how well it's gone. Okay, uh, so, great. what I'm going to talk about today is antecedents, moderators, and mediators in cross-domain knowledge integration and knowledge co-creation for sustainable development. And you'll see on this first slide that there are uh, two logos here. There's the km for dev logo and also the real KM uh, logo. Uh, and that's because um, this particular research is actually primarily through km for dev with the support of real KM and uh, km for dev and real KM have established a very effective uh, partnership uh, and uh, that particular partnership came about or was uh, uh, founded through uh, the research that I'm actually going to be talking about today. So I think it's it's both, uh, I hope to talk about both the research itself and also how that particular partnership was established and its benefits. Um, so first of all, before I do get into the presentation, uh, as I'm back in Australia temporarily, I'd just like to acknowledge the terrible people who are the traditional custodians of Mianjin or central Brisbane, and that's the land on which this particular presentation is being given. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to the terrible elders uh, past and present. 
uh, and there's a link there on the bottom of the screen if you'd like to find out some more about the um, Turbal First Nation and the activities that they're carrying out and the work they're carrying out to keep their uh, cultural heritage alive and in people's uh, knowledge and awareness. So first of all, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a knowledge management, environmental management, um, project management and education professional. I'm editor, lead writer and a director of the award-winning Real KM magazine and also a member of uh, km for dev and the km for dev core group. For those of you who may not be aware of km for dev it's the knowledge management for development community and I'll talking a little bit more about both km for dev and real km in a moment. And I also teach for Beijing Foreign Studies University's CHP program in Baotou in Inner Mongolia, uh, which is in the north of China. Uh, and as I said earlier, I've had to make a brief visit back to Australia to uh, attend to uh, my storage shed that I use uh, while I'm overseas, uh, having suffered a break in. Uh, and needing to move my things uh, elsewhere. Um, but I'll be back there in a couple of days time back to China. So uh, just a bit on my qualifications and experience. I'm a PhD candidate in the Knowledge Technology and Innovation Group at Wageningen University and Research. Uh, and that's the, the focus of the research that I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, in this presentation. I also have a Master of Environmental Management with distinction, and that included uh, social ecological complexity studies. And linked to that, I've got 30 years of experience in environmental management with a focus on knowledge engagement in the face of complexity. And uh, that knowledge engagement has been the widest possible range of knowledge engagement from science through to um, stakeholders and being able to draw that together and work through the complexities of that to achieve outcomes. Um, that, uh, well, my first career though was as a, an avionics technician in the Air Force, and I have a, an electronics qualification as a result of that. Uh, and I've also had uh, seven years of teaching experience. Uh, in addition to uh, Real KM, my knowledge management experience includes using agile and KM approaches to oversee a major uh, river recovery program for the iconic uh, Hawkes Winnipean River, river in Western Sydney. Uh, it's a major river system and it's the water supply source for, for the greater Sydney area. Um, and uh, so it's a highly stressed river system. Um, so I oversaw a major river recovery program for that river, again, involving a lot of knowledge management activities. I've also led a knowledge strategy process for Australia's 56 natural resource management regional organisations, uh, which covers the whole of the country and pioneered multi-stakeholder and multiple knowledge approaches to support sustainable landscape management. And I also initiated and taught two new new knowledge management subjects at Shanxi University in China. So now to talk about um, the two uh, key stakeholder organizations in the research I'm going to be talking about. First of all, km for dev uh, km for dev was founded in 2001. So it's been uh, in existence for more than 20 years. It's a global community of practice of primarily uh, international development practitioners who have an interest in KM and knowledge sharing theory practice and related matters. Its activities include face-to-face -face and online meetings and forums, in particular uh, um, a range of uh, a regular um, knowledge cafe on a range of different topics to do with um, knowledge management in a development context. And those knowledge cafes are uh, very popular. And if you haven't participated in or joined any of them, I'd very much recommend uh, signing up for them. Uh, KM4Dev has two online community platforms. 
It has a uh, website with 6,000 members and an email discussion group with 1,168 members. And uh, some key people in km for dev are with us today. Uh, in particular, I'd like to just mention uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Cummings, who's been, a, uh, I would consider, a, a major stalwart in km for dev um, through its history. And uh, her uh, leadership and knowledge is, is pivotal to um, the success and ongoing uh, initiatives that the KM for Dev carries out. And we also have uh, Gladys Kemboy with us as well. Uh, and uh, hopefully I haven't missed any other KM for Dev members that, that are here with us. But if there are, then um, welcome to everyone. Then Real KM. Uh, Real KM was established in 2015 with the objective of promoting and supporting evidence-based knowledge management. And we do that through sharing high value KM and related research. So KM, or real KM's um, remit is, I guess, a bit different to some other uh, groups and forums uh, in the KM space in that our primary focus is research promotion. So we're not a discussion group. We're not an opinion-based uh, service. Our, our uh, focus is entirely on research promotion. And we do that through publishing research summaries. So what I do is, is I keep on top of the emerging KM research and I then publish summaries of that. Uh, I also work with uh, people who have, are uh, writing and publishing that research uh, to get them to, to write some of those summaries as well. And I also write feature articles on significant emerging KM topics, drawing together the relevant research and also uh, article series, again, um, that promote research. Uh, we have more than 8,000 subscribers and followers now and we've published more than 1,900 article, articles and in February last year passed the highly significant milestone of 1 million total article views. Uh, and I think 2 million isn't too far off um, being reached um, in, in the time since. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Stephen Bounds, who was actually the founder under of Real KM, um, he's it was his foresight that led to the establishment of Real KM, and I'd also like to acknowledge our um, supporters who uh, contribute financially and also in kind to our ongoing function. Without uh, those uh, supporters, we wouldn't exist. So now to move on to the meat of uh, today's presentation. And it's to talk about the PhD research that I'm carrying out. And the title of that research is Antecedents, Moderators and Mediators in Cross-Domain Knowledge Integration and Knowledge Co-Creation for Sustainable Development. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this uh, PhD has been carried out through the Knowledge Technology and Innovation Department at Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands. And it's guided by um, Dr. Sarah Cummings. And uh, it's part of, well, I'm one of a, a cohort of PhD candidates that grew out of the km for dev research group. Uh, so KMGN has this particular research group and km for dev also has a research group that was established a couple of years ago. And uh, our PhDs came out of that, uh, as did um, some other things that I'll talk about as we go through. So first of all, to talk about the context for the research that I'm carrying out. So um, we've had identified about a decade ago, uh, a fifth generation of knowledge management for development. And that was identified by Sarah Cummings and colleagues. And um, I'll talk more uh, later about the other generations and how the fifth generation flows on from those other generations. But the uh, 
the uh, distinguishing concept of this fifth generation is cross domain knowledge integration and knowledge co-creation. And the uh, features of, of that are multiple knowledges. So drawing together multiple uh, sources of knowledge, multiple stakeholder processes or multi-stakeholder processes. So involving the widest possible range of stakeholders, which brings with it uh, or is linked into multiple knowledges. Uh, global public good and knowledge commons. Um, so seeing knowledge as a, a common resource, an emphasis on local knowledge. Um, so being able to understand what's going on locally and emergence and complexity and emergence and complexity. Um, you will have all heard, I'm sure, uh, Dave Snowden talk about uh, those two particular topics, but there's also a wide range of other research that's been published uh, in regard to emergence and complexity as well. So those uh, are the features of the fifth generation of knowledge management for um, development. And um, since the early 1990s, um, cross-domain knowledge integration and knowledge co-creation have been successfully applied in local scale sustainable natural resource management initiatives here in Australia, including in the work that I've done um, myself. Um, just as an example is one project here, the sustainable management of the Helden Hills. And the Helden Hills is a large area of um, natural forest that's located about an hour and a half's drive west of where I'm sitting right now here in Brisbane. And this particular area of bushland has a large number of significant species, including a number of plant and animal species that are only found within this particular uh, area of bushland. So they're completely unique to this particular area of forest. Um, however, the area was facing a range of different impacts from timber harvesting, sandstone mining, tourism, recreation, uh, and various other pursuits that were having um, potentially detrimental impacts on the environment. So uh, I carried out a project to look at all of the youth land uses in the area, to look at its environmental values, and then to draw together the, all of the stakeholders, the multi-stakeholder knowledge, multiple knowledges being both uh, scientific knowledge and the knowledge of the various um, uh, pursuits being carried out in the area. And I facilitated a collaborative learning and governance process that allowed everybody to learn from everybody else about the important environmental values of the area, about all of the competing land uses, about how everybody else felt about everybody else's land uses, and then to bring everybody together into a facilitated process where we worked through areas of commonality and areas of difference uh, to understand the complexities of all of the different knowledges and how they fitted together, didn't fit together, and what we needed to do to make them all be able to work together moving forward. It was a very uh, complex and, in, and involved process, but at the end of it, it was highly successful. Uh, and this is just an excerpt from the local newspaper where the council uh, had a meeting to finalise the project. And you'll see there that um, they were very happy with how I'd uh, worked with multiple knowledges and multi-stakeholders to be able to resolve uh, a lot of differences um, in um, points of view to be able to have a direction forward. And this is one of a number of projects that I've carried out, drawing together these multiple knowledges uh, and multi-stakeholder approaches and to be able to understand uh, ways forward. And also many other people have done projects like this at a local scale in Australia as well. Uh, however, these local scale initiatives are not upscaling to the bigger level, uh, in particular the national level. And you'll see here a, a headline, uh, and this is a headline from 
um, just November in 2017 from The Conversation, which is a, a science, online science publication. And you'll see there that Australia has um, is ranked among the world's worst in regard to biodiversity conservation. So despite these local level initiatives that are working very well at a national level, we're not getting that scaling. So at a national level, Australia is actually near the bottom in regard to biodiversity conservation. And we've had some pretty devastating extinctions of species and we have a number of other species that are heading in that direction. That might surprise some of you to see a headline like this. There seems to be this odd belief uh, worldwide that Australia is an environmental leader. I can assure you it's not. It's actually near the bottom. Um, and, and that's a, a source of a lot of distress for those of us who've worked in the conservation sector for a long time. And uh, if we move to greenhouse gas emissions, um, you'll see there that uh, uh, in an assessment by the UN a couple of years ago, uh, Australia scored worst out of all of the UN countries that were assessed in this particular assessment. So, um, so yeah, Australia is actually doing pretty badly when it comes to environmental management, despite the success of local level initiatives. Um, however, for those of you who are working at the international level, unfortunately, the news isn't particularly good there generally either. Um, so in the time since the establishment of the UN in, the nine, in 1945, it has launched seven decades of international development. The current one of those decades, well, it's actually a little longer than a decade, it's 15 years and it's the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030 that covers the period 2015 to 2030. And we're now in 2023 at the midpoint of those 15 years, and the UN has just published a report, um, a special report, looking at the uh, SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals at their midpoint, and you'll see there at the bottom of the screen that the assessment is not good. It says there that at the midpoint, a sobering reality emerges. The world is falling short of meeting most of the goals by 2030. And while certain areas have witnessed progress, as I've said, certain local areas, there remains a concerning proportion of targets that are either progressing too slowly or regressing. Uh, and that particular report is this one, the Sustainable Development Goals Report, special edition, uh, special edition for the midpoint uh, of the SDGs. And I very much encourage you uh, to uh, download that report and have a look at it, um, as well as uh, talking about uh, the uh, sad uh, lack of progress towards many of the goals. Uh, it also puts forward some directions that we need to take to get back on track. And I have to say that I find those pretty underwhelming and a lot of them are sort of aspirational and talk about, um, you know, uh, general in general terms, what we should be doing. Uh, and I didn't see a whole lot of tangible detail that really gave me confidence that the next seven years are going to be any different to the last seven years. So, so things are pretty bad in terms of sustainable development. If we're really going to achieve the SDGs, then we're really going to have to change the way we're doing things and start doing things a, lot, a whole lot better. So the lack of sustainability progress suggests that there are antecedents, moderators and mediators in the facilitation of sustainable outcomes. In other words, that there are things that are potentially going to assist us to move forward and that there are potentially things that are stopping us from moving forward. And gaining a better understanding of those variables is the focus of my research. So after spending many years working in sustainable uh, environmental management, I've reached a, a frustration point 
with how things are going. And uh, I've decided rather than continuing to uh, bash my head against a brick wall, I really need to understand what's going wrong and why these local activities that are working very well are not scaling at the bigger level. So that's the focus of, of this particular research. So there are three areas of investigation that I'm uh, moving forward on, uh, cultural and societal factors, dark side knowledge management tactics, that's something you may have not heard about, um, and coloniality in knowledge and knowledge management. Those three particular areas are interrelated, um, so they, they overlap considerably. And what I'm going to talk about uh, in from uh, in the remainder of the presentation is primarily the third one. And that's because the first paper from this research has been published as the first paper in a new special issue of the Knowledge Management for Development Journal. And the Knowledge Management for Development Journal is an initiative of km for dev and uh, Sarah Cummings, who is with us here uh, in this uh, uh, meeting today is um, the uh, senior editor uh, for for that journal. Um, and uh, it's a, um, a very significant evidence-based journal in the knowledge management field. And it has over its uh, time of existence um, published a large range of research to do with knowledge management in a development context. Um, and it's a very important journal to be aware of. It's open access and it's also free to contribute to. Uh, and that's because of the very considerable efforts of, of Sarah and colleagues that the journal uh, has that um, status. Um, so uh, a lot of um, research is unfortunately published behind paywalls. That's not the case with this particular journal. It's all open access. And as I say, it's free to contribute. Um, but if anyone can support uh, the journal through your assistance, that, that's very much valued as well. Um, and, and while I see on my screen both Sarah and Edwin, um, uh, just to quickly mention to Edwin that I'm still following up in regard to what I mentioned about um, uh, taking the idea of actually turning a number of our papers into podcasts. And I think, yeah, that will assist in disseminating our research even, even wider. So sorry to put that in, but yeah, seeing both of you there is a good opportunity to um, follow that up. So this particular paper that we have published um, titled, um, the paper in, uh, is titled, We Have a Dream Proposing Decolonization of Knowledge as a sixth generation of knowledge management for sustainable development. So that's the title of the paper. Uh, and the we have a dream part of it comes from the fact that both the authors of the paper and um, I'm co-authors, a co-author of the paper together with uh, Sarah Cummings, uh, Fitz and Habtamerium, and also Gladys Kemboy, who's with us here in this uh, presentation today. So with, uh, with Sarah and Fitzam and Gladys, we've co-authored this paper and uh, it's titled, or uh, begins with, we have a dream, recognizing that we have um, as authors and the wider development uh, km for dev community, we have a common aspiration for a fairer development knowledge system and ecology. And adopting We Have a Dream as the slogan of the sixth generation of knowledge management for sustainable development uh, reflects that this new generation was formally proposed and launched at a special event uh, at the Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial Library in Washington uh, back in May this year, a couple of months ago. Uh, and that was a, a very significant landmark event to launch uh, what we're calling the sixth generation. So the sixth generation of knowledge management for sustainable development, uh, the paper presents a conceptual framework for this new generation. 
and using the term sustainable development rather than just development reflects the importance of development which is sustainable in terms of people and planet for the reasons that I've talked about earlier in this presentation that we really need to ramp up our progress towards sustainable development and we really need to ramp up knowledge management's contribution to that. Um, so the identifying concept of the new sixth generation of knowledge management for sustainable development is the decolonization of knowledge. And it follows on this new sixth generation, follows on from the fifth generation of knowledge management for development. And that was first proposed 10 years ago by Sarah Cumming and colleagues. And the identifying concept of that uh, was what I've already talked about in the presentation, which was cross-domain knowledge integration and knowledge co-creation. Uh, and we've been doing that for quite a while now. Um, and that fifth generation follows on from four earlier generations. And these are the first or the first four generations. The first generation was ICT based and it identified knowledge as a commodity. Then the second generation of knowledge management to development was organization based with the identifying concept of knowledge as an asset within organizations. Then the third generation was knowledge sharing based um, with the identifying concept of knowledge sharing between organizations. Um, so from the second to the third, we moved from an internal focus within organizations to getting organizations sharing knowledge between each other. Uh, and each generation doesn't replace the previous one, it adds to it. So uh, collectively, you end up with all of these concepts together. Then the fourth generation was practice based, and that was where uh, knowledge processes were embedded in organizational processes. Um, so as well as seeing as an asset, but actually embedding it within the processes of the organization. So the development of the conceptual framework for the pro proposed new generation hasn't involved the conduct of empirical research or a typical literature review. And that's because there isn't a whole lot of research that's yet been published. There's been some, but at this point, um, it's it's a conceptual approach that we, we took with the paper. And what we did was we developed it through a collaborative and co-creative um, social process driven by the km for dev community. Um, and as I said, um, it's been assisted by uh, an emerging but still very small body of research in regard to the decolonization of knowledge in the context of sustainable development. And the special issue that um, this particular paper uh, is the first paper in uh, actually substantially moves that forward. And I think it's probably the, the, the largest collection of papers on this particular topic um, to date. Um, so, uh, as well as publishing our own paper, um, uh, the, the uh, special issue helps to move this research base forward. So, the collaborative and co-creative social processes that have led to the development of the conceptual framework for uh, the sixth generation of knowledge management for sustainable development had their genesis um, towards the end of 2019. And at that time, the topic and issue of decolonization began to be raised in the km for dev discussion group. And it was actually Sarah um, who put in a couple of comments about that and questions uh, to the community to start to get people thinking about it. And uh, the impetus for, for decolonization um, in the broader sense has come from uh, outside uh, the knowledge management sector. And it's come from uh, a number of places, but in particular, higher education sector. And uh, there's been some key uh, people, a uh, person called Romina Estrati, Dr. Romina Estrati, for example, has been uh, working on decolonization uh, for quite some time and uh, 
a number of other people have set up some fairly major uh, networks that are just focused on decolonization, in particular decolonization in regard to knowledge. Uh, one of those is a group called the Deco Decolonial Critique, and the Decolonial Critique now has more than 1,800 members just focused on decolonization. So you can see that uh, from, the, from the interest in that particular group that decolonization is a serious and important issue for a growing number of people, particularly in academia and related uh, areas. Uh, at the same time that decolonization of knowledge was raised within the uh, KM for Dev discussion group, um, I also independently put it forward in Real KM magazine. Uh, and I put it forward in two articles. Um, this is uh, one of those articles which had the heading, uh, New Ishi Initiatives uh, um, Begin Decolonizing Research Libraries and Knowledge Systems. But what about decolonizing knowledge management? Um, so I had identified from the growing research base that this was an issue that KM should be uh, working with, just as uh, Sarah had identified within uh, KM for Dev. And it followed on from a 2018 article that I'd written that um, had uh, looked at um, the published research uh, across the world and how that's very much concentrated uh, in uh, just a very small part of the world. So most of the research that we've been using uh, in both um, generally for, for just about every topic uh, and also in particular for knowledge management, most of that research is generated not globally, but in a very small part of the globe. Uh, and if we have a look at this particular map here, this is from a bibliometric review um, that was carried out uh, in uh, 2018. And you can see looking at this particular map, that most of the knowledge management research, and this is a map of knowledge management research, um, the red numbers indicate numbers of papers on knowledge management. And you'll see that um, North America and Europe are the dominant uh, places on the map where knowledge management research has been produced. And those areas, uh, North America and Europe, have a fairly uniform culture. But if you look at Africa, South America and Southeast Asia in particular, you'll see that there's very little research that's been published on knowledge management from those particular areas. So there's a whole lot of perspectives on knowledge management from a whole lot of the world that just isn't being plugged into our decision making in regard to knowledge management. So. Um, Seeing this, I recognised that there was a need to decolonise the research base for knowledge management. And then as I started to pursue that, to also decolonise the practice base as well. So uh, when I published those particular uh, articles, um, Gladys uh, Kemboy from km for dev uh, reached out to me and invited me to participate in KM for Dev's Knowledge Cafe number seven in June 2020, together with Charles Dewar. Uh, and Charles is from Africa and he publishes blog posts on uh, knowledge to do with, in particular, markets in Africa. And I've republished a number of those in Rukam magazine, but they're a fascinating read on local perspectives on knowledge in Africa. Um, so uh, seeing my two articles that I've just had in the previous uh, slides, um, Gladys Kemboy invited me to join uh, this particular knowledge cafe. And this was the beginning of the collaboration and partnership between Real KM and KM for Dev. And in the time since there's been um, a series of six knowledge cafes of on uh, the topic of decolonization of knowledge, and you'll see those listed there. And I've highlighted one in particular uh, in yellow there, which was in November, 2020, and it had the title, 
uncomfortable truths in development. And that particular knowledge cafe um, was associated with and inspired by an extensive uncomfortable truths discussion in the km for dev discussion group. Um, and this particular discussion in the km for dev discussion group came about when one of the members of km for dev posted a confronting article title, What's Killing Us in International NGOs? And um, she strongly criticized what she saw as international developments, supremacy culture, as a product of colonialism, capitalism, and geopolitics. And uh, if we go back to uh, this map here, you can see really that supremacy culture. You can see Europe and North America have dominated the production of knowledge to do with knowledge management. So, um, uh, uh, Anne Hendricks Jenkins' uh, observation was quite accurate in terms of uh, the colonialism um, and supremacy culture of the, the Euro-American point of view. Uh, and that particular knowledge cafe also stimulated the writing of a series of equally thought-provoking uh, blog posts, and they're listed here. And those particular blog posts can be viewed on the km for dev website. And the ideas and uh, that were developed and debated in the knowledge cafes and also in the blog posts inspired and informed the features of the sixth generation of knowledge management for sustainable development. And what I'm going to do now is talk about the features of the sixth generation. Um, so the identifying concept of the sixth generation is the decolonization of knowledge. And the slogan is we have a dream. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that came about through our um, collective dream for what we would like to see knowledge management for development um, or sustainable development become. Uh, and also was um, uh, linked to the fact that we launched the sixth generation in the Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial Library. So there are six uh, particular features of the sixth generation, epistemic justice, anti-racism, indigenous and local knowledge, diversity and KM approaches, new knowledge partnerships, and new knowledge practices. Uh, epistemic um, justice, uh, and this is uh, something that um, Sarah Companies has um, pioneered and advanced, uh, and uh, together with, uh, with colleagues mentioned in the paper there, and it builds on research in other fields of academia and practice. And epistemic justice is about justice in uh, or knowledge related justice. So it's about justice in knowledge production and justice in uh, knowledge perspectives. And there are three sort of key aspects to epistemic justice. There's individual and collective justice, structural justice and systemic justice. And you'll see in this particular diagram, the different aspects of each of those three uh, main aspects of epistemic justice. Um, and um, epistemic justice aims at um, reversing that or reversing those biases that have existed in knowledge generation and knowledge use as a result of uh, coloniality um, or colonialism first and then continued coloniality in uh, knowledge production. And the paper here, I'd recommend following the link and reading that paper. There's also uh, a summary of this paper as an article in Real KM Magazine. So I'd very much uh, recommend heading to Real KM Magazine and reading a lot more about epistemic justice. It's something that you're going to hear more and more about. Uh, the second feature is anti-racism, and there's currently a notable concern and active dialogue uh, within the international development sector regarding potential ways in which racism and white supremacy culture 
uh, including the influence of colonialism, um, coloniality, uh, and racial dynamics um, may manifest as underlying issues in the sector's culture, systems, processes, and narratives. Uh, this particular um, paper looks at dimensions of racism in regard to international development. And this comes from a study of a, um, an organization based in the UK. And if you have a look at these dimensions of racism in international development, there's some of them that really should uh, cause knowledge management practitioners to stop and think not just about knowledge management for development, but knowledge management generally. For example, if you look at the Eurocentrism dimension, it says there um, that the definition of that is the imposition of European Western thought and leadership on uh, everyone. Um, and if we go back again to the map that I showed earlier, this is what knowledge management is doing generally. We have Euro-American thought being imposed on the world, um, which is Eurocentrism. So um, am I suggesting that knowledge management uh, as an activity is potentially racist? Um, unfortunately, yes, I am. Uh, that's perhaps going to upset a few people, but I think it needs to be said and needs to be realised that what we know as knowledge management was generated in um, Europe and North America to a large extent um, and reflects the culture and values of those particular areas, yet is being imposed on the rest of the world. Um, it's been interesting when I mention to people that I'm back in China, um, the first thing they say to me is, um, oh, you're going to do consulting on knowledge management there. And I have to say no, that I'm back here to listen again. And I learned that lesson in my last uh, time in China a number of years ago, and I'll talk about that shortly. But no, I'm here to listen and learn. I'm not here to continue uh, spreading Western ideas to another culture. Uh, indigenous and local knowledge is the next of the features of the sixth generation. Um, and uh, local and Indigenous knowledge is something that has been passed down through the ages through uh, First Nations or uh, Indigenous communities, and it reflects a close connection to the landscape. So from a sustainable um, management point of view, um, Indigenous and local knowledge is connected to the local landscape. Uh, it flows from that. So it makes a lot of sense to be using Indigenous and local knowledge in our decision making to do with sustainable development. And there has been progress in this regard. Um, here in Australia, there's been a, uh, the widespread or grow, increasingly widespread use of Indigenous knowledge in regard to fire management, for example, which has been a major problem in Australia for a long period of time. But being able to have fire management practices that protect the environment while at the same time protecting life and property. And three years ago in Australia, or um, three and a half years ago in Australia, there were major bushfires that devastated much of the east coast of Australia. Um, so it's been a real crisis, but Indigenous and local knowledge is able to um, provide long-term informed uh, approaches to be able to manage fire successfully in the landscape. Diversity in KM approaches is uh, the, the next of the features of the sixth generation. And as I've said, what is known as KM originated in a relatively small part of the world, uh, primarily Europe and North America, that has generally uniform culture and values. And while much of the rest of the world may not have practiced what we call KM, um, it has been successfully managing knowledge for a very long time and has prevent, potentially learnt much in the process. Um, here in Australia, um, Europeans have been here for a bit over 200 years, 
uh, indigenous people were here for 60,000 years before that. Um, in the past 200 years, the, uh, the European uh, descendants have pretty much managed to wreck the environment in a large, to a large extent, whereas for 60,000 years, Indigenous people were able to live sustainably within the boundaries of the environment. So it, it actually seems quite bizarre to me that we're not really going back and studying to the greatest possible extent uh, those indigenous practices and really you know, spending the time we're doing uh, studying Western practices. I think it's really time to, to start looking uh, in the main at uh, what's been practiced for a much longer period of time and more successfully. Just as an example of that, um, when I first came to China, uh, I first came to China in 2012, and then um, fairly soon after that, I started teaching at Shanxi University um, in uh, northern China, uh, and I taught uh, initially an undergraduate um, uh, KM subject that I developed, and then um, after that, a KM and innovation subject that I developed for PhD students. And those uh, subjects went quite well. But as I was teaching the um, KM for uh, innovation uh, in for the PhD students, um, the PhD students, or one of them in particular, actually stopped me in my tracks and said, well, what you're trying to teach us is Western KM approaches. Here in China, we actually have more effective approaches for dealing with um, some key things that I was talking about, in particular, external stakeholder knowledge. And she introduced me to um, Xiaomi, um, a Chinese company, Xiaomi, which um, started out as a mobile phone uh, manufacturer and is now spread into other areas. And Xiaomi has real time connection with its stakeholders. Uh, it doesn't call its users users, it calls them fans. And it has real time live connections to them so that they can report their issues, ideas, and thoughts directly to Xiaomi. And Xiaomi updates its user system. It's, operating system on a weekly basis um, in collaboration with its fans. And as a result, its fan base is very positive, happy and engaged. And the product that Xiaomi develops um, is just cutting edge. Um, and uh, on the bottom of the screen there, you'll see a link to a video on the Real KM website, where I actually give two case studies of to Western companies that didn't use external stakeholder knowledge successfully. Uh, one is Boeing and one is um, Toyota. And both of them killed a lot of people by not doing that. Um, and I then show how the approach used by Xiaomi was actually much better and could have helped those companies. So what I did when I was teaching at Chance University was come to the stark realization that I had more to learn uh, in China than I had to teach um, people. Um, so uh, I started to basically close my mouth and close my, uh, and open my ears uh, and open my eyes and start to learn. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about um, where that's going to progress from here on uh, shortly. The next feature is knowledge partnerships and um, many uh, development sectors are establishing effective knowledge partnerships, in particular forging partnerships between um, Global South and Global North. Um, Global South relates to uh, primarily developing countries. Global North relates to developed countries. So having partnerships to bridge those knowledge gaps and communities of practice are an important tool for facilitating that. Uh, and as I say in the third point there, um, KM for Dev is an outstanding and groundbreaking example of a successful community of practice and it's built knowledge partnerships uh, and continues to do so um, in a, in a uh, virtual space 
with limited face-to-face -face interaction over two decades. And as I said, it was KM for Dev that reached out to Real KM and established a partnership with Real KM. And that's a, a real example of the of the communities of practice that um, uh, and and uh, how they can be successfully used. I'll add a, a note of caution though, in that I've also seen um, communities for practice um, be destructive. And um, a, a very sad example of that is just to the West here, um, a First Nations uh, tribe that I first started working with um, 30 years ago is in the process of um, basically falling apart and communities of practice have unfortunately played a role in bringing that about. And they've done so by um, basically promoting elders who were never elders, but were actually the white colonists ideas of elders um, as being the knowledge holders within the tribe and at the expense of the real elders. Um, the, the people who the knowledge, the people who the colonists put up as the elders were men, whereas the elders were actually women. Um, so the colonists had a male dominated society and they came to Australia and they immediately thought that the elders in the Aboriginal groups had to be men too. So they made them into elders when in fact they never were. They were actually women and particularly well, certainly in this uh, group and in many others as well. Um, and then um, that splintered the group and then communities of practice have continued to allow the false elders to have an equal voice to the real elders. And then more recently, it's meant that the actual elders, the real elders have splintered as well because younger people have been given an equal voice to elders. So I think instead of imposing communities of practice, we need to be looking at um, elders as knowledge holders, as, as more important knowledge holders in an indigenous community, and perhaps what they can teach Western knowledge holders about the use of expert knowledge. Um, we have the situation now where um, anyone on Facebook can be a so-called expert in something, um, and uh, when, when they actually know nothing about that particular topic, maybe they watched a few YouTube videos, call themselves an expert on Facebook and have an opinion about a topic. Whereas our knowledge elders, our experts, people who've studied things for a very long time are being um, sidelined. So perhaps instead of uh, imposing ideas on Indigenous communities, we should be looking at how their elder structure worked to maintain knowledge holders and um, continue important knowledge through the tribal system um, from the past to the future. So I'd suggest that. Uh, as well, we have uh, new knowledge practices and there are three of those. This is the final feature of the sixth generation. So we have evidence-based knowledge as the first one and Real KM exists for that as the, does the knowledge management uh, for development journal. The second one there is about um, community-led behavior change in recognition that we not only need policies at higher levels, but people have to change their attitudes, behaviors, and practices. Unless we get individual change, we're not going to meet the sustainable development goals. And then the last one of these practices is facilitation. And facilitation is a vital skill in being able to uh, bring disparate knowledges together and being able to work through the differences that are created in that regard. Uh, in the very last few slides of this presentation, I'll just talk about where I'm going to head to now. Um, the, my PhD is uh, in its early stages with this first paper published, and I'm now going to be moving forward and looking at the first and second items here with the, the uh, paper already published, having um, substantially addressed the third element here. 
So I'm now going to be moving forward on cultural and societal factors and dark side knowledge management tactics. Um, just to talk about, first of all, cultural and societal factors and some of the things I'm going to be looking at. Um, related to what I was talking about with the example of Xiaomi in China, um, compared to uh, the types of Western KM approaches, compared to what Xiaomi does. Um, this particular picture here is uh, pictures of angry um, stakeholders burning the guide to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan here in Australia. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan uh, covers a large part of the Australian landmass and is our major agricultural river system. Um, and um, it's been controversial and problematic ever since it was first initiated with important knowledge left out of the process, in particular, um, landholder stakeholders and indigenous stakeholders. Um, and as a result, community support has been very low. Um, so this particular um, plan was supposed to be finalized now and functional, but it's still completely dysfunctional. And as I said, it, it covers about a quarter of Australia's land mass. It's a very significant plan, but it's been a failure. In contrast, um, I've had the pleasure of spending uh, in China um, months living with friends in their village on the lowest plateau um, in northern China. And the lowest plateau was um, subject to a major World Bank um, series of two major projects that have been highly successful in engaging multi-stakeholders and engaging multiple knowledges, working through the complexities of that and achieving some amazing outcomes, both in terms of um, repairing the landscape and also getting people out of poverty and into sustainable futures heading forward. Um, and this is the, that particular landscape and what it looks like now in an advanced state of recovery. Um, so I'm going to explore this some more and do some more learning in this regard. Um, then um, in regard to dark side knowledge management tactics, um, this was something raised in a paper in 2006. And uh, unfortunately with knowledge and, and the knowledge we work with in knowledge management, there's the general assumption that people always use knowledge for good. And then they don't. There's a large part of our society that uses knowledge for their own um, personal gain and often in illegal and immoral ways. Uh, and unfortunately in Australia, we've seen uh, time and time again, examples of that. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that I'd managed a major project to do with the river system um, in Western Sydney. Um, and this is something that has occurred since then. There's been a proposal to raise the dam wall and flood a large area of World Heritage Forest. And um, it's a bit difficult to read, but what this particular article talks about is how the government um, uh, pushed scientists into downplaying the scientific findings in regard to that World Heritage Forest um, and compromising their reports. Um, and fortunately, um, the people who had been pushed into doing this went whistleblower. Um, and it was actually two friends of mine who, who went whistleblower and spoke out to the media uh, and stopped this. But unfortunately, this sort of science suppression happens time and time again in Australia. And also uh, indigenous knowledge is suppressed in this way as well. Um, so uh, again, this uh, exposes the myth of um, uh, the wonder of Australia as an, an environmental manager when um, environmental science is actively suppressed by governments in this way. Uh, this is another uh, example and a little bit different. Um, this is a, a very uh, popular book on Aboriginal fire management in Australia, but it's written by a white historian, um, a, per, a person called Bill Gamage. 
and I've been um, dissecting this particular book and I've found within it that there's a lot of just completely false information that is so blatantly false that it looks intentional to actually intentionally mislead the readers. Um, and one of my papers will be focused on this. I'm sure it's going to be highly controversial when it's published, but we really need to highlight that you know, a white historian writing a book on Aboriginal land management is just so fundamentally wrong. We should be asking Indigenous people themselves um, what their views are instead of um, lauding books written by uh, other people who are supposedly writing about them, but are clearly not. Um, so that ends the, the presentation. Um, and uh, it's been uh, quite long, so I hope uh, I hope I haven't put all of you uh, to sleep. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so thank you very much for uh, for uh, listening to the presentation. Um, and if anyone has any uh, questions, I'd uh, very much um, uh, welcome those. Thank you so much, Bruce, uh, for this uh, uh, very. Um enlightening and uh, also not controversial but really uh, um, I think all of us question I mean question ourselves about all these things that we may never have thought about and that, that's great that you could bring them up and uh, not only you but everyone also working on this topic so yes yeah, so we have uh, 10 more minutes and uh, we've got some some comments and uh, on the chat uh, maybe uh, Kay Abbott, do you wanna do you wanna take the mic and and maybe share your your point of view? I could do that. Um, I work a lot in development, and I agree with everything Bruce said about the presumption that the Western way of working is universal. Of course, we do have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that also was developed mostly by Westerners. Um, and so when I see things like SDGs that are um, very inclusive but madly ambitious and not really attainable, um, that bothers me because it was a 20-year distraction away from very focused essential needs to broader needs, uh, an inventory of everything the world would love to achieve. And uh, it lets everybody focus on what they want to focus on instead of the real core primary, what we used to call basic. But um, this thing with technology, um, I heard people saying that climate change, global warming, uh, environmental disaster is the fault of the West because of industry. And I think that could be true. Um, we do know there is a geomagnetic reversal in process that's meant to create havoc for about 100 years, but there's no question that we've left a disastrous mark on the planet. On the other hand, how many people want to live without uh, all of the benefits of industry, the vaccines when people fall ill, the smartphone, the motorbike? Um, and so just because a country didn't loot to invent those things, they still make use of those things. So, so I see that contradiction. But I also see in development, a huge change needs to take place based on man knowledge management concepts. There has to be an integration between local understanding, local aims, and then what ways Western methods or technology might be able to help. And that we said for years that we have participatory development and yet, Still, the donor dictates, the donor wants to see results, results that are benefiting uh, and appreciated by the West. So this is the contradiction I'm struggling with, um, that the, the discipline of knowledge management was created mostly by Western countries, but we see now many productive assets coming from China, from Brazil, so it's changing. Um, but I, um, I, I see this, the, the, you know, it's, it's much more complex. Um, I don't really like the word colonizing. I think there's maybe a better way to explain exactly what it is because no one's forced to take the knowledge. But um, I do think um, the, the Western imposition is not 
it's proven to not be the solution. So we need to find other methods. That's all I'd say. Uh, and yeah, Kerry, I think I would agree with pretty much all that you've said there. So uh, yeah, and and yeah, the SDGs themselves, um, yeah, are very much Western uh, influenced. Um, so so yeah, that's a critical aspect. And and also with what you mentioned about donors, um, uh, you know, there's there's also the political or geopolitical aspect of of donors as well. In that, um, you know, they're uh, they're not just in investing in, in um, you know, donating or being donors um, just to, to you know, from a from a nice thing to do uh, it's all part of their geopolitical agenda and, and that influences what they spend their money on and how they spend it so um, yeah so you know that needs to be considered as well uh, I want to jump in uh, Kerry I agree very much with you being in the complexity and the balancing between different uh, directions, different understandings. And I think that it's very important because we in KMGN are neutral. We're not taking sides. We may be hosting different opinions, but we want people to understand that we are not with one or another or specific opinion. And I think that on behalf of KMGN, it has to be said very loudly in such a lecture uh, we are giving you the stage, but do not agree or, do, or disagree with anything said uh, here, because I think that we had a lot of discrimination marks that I'm not sure that I wouldn't put a question mark near them. Okay, do we have additional uh, question or, or comments for, for Bruce? And I, yeah, I haven't been able to sort of yeah, keep uh, up no, with no, the no, chat. No, 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 that's fine. So I think there's yeah. been... A, Ed, Edwin, you wanted to uh, share your thoughts or it was just a reply to a comment? It was a reply to a comment, but yeah. basically the, the, the scope of what humanity has to face is in this world of digitization is to verify and validate sources. And I mean, that's really what this is all about. It's, it's who's putting the content out and being suspect of all things. And that's, I think, is the biggest takeaway. Thank you, Bruce. And and, and, and Bruce, um, I mean, you, you focus, of course, mainly on, on knowledge management research. But I, I think, I mean, if we look at other research in other fields, I think there is probably, uh, I mean, similar kind of pattern, right? I mean, uh, if we look in in medicine or if we look in engineering, I think the the spread might be similar. Am I correct, or or, or is there really a specificity about knowledge management research which is not uh, as spread as 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 other discipline? Uh, no, it's pretty much uniform. Um, uh, in the articles in Real Came magazine on on the, the research spread globally. Uh, it, I give another uh, uh, examples from other sectors and also an overall example. And yeah, it's almost identical for the overall research base and particular sectors. They're all biased towards North America and Europe um, with a smattering around the rest of the world and almost none from South America, Southeast Asia and Africa. So, so yeah, it's, it's almost a standard thing for our so-called knowledge base. Um, it really isn't uh, you know, a global knowledge base. It's a Euro-American knowledge base. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think it's, um, um... Oh, I lost my uh, uh, trend of thought. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, like uh, Keobot mentioned early on, I mean, it's not all knowledge which is uh, forced on, on people, right? I mean, if I just take the example of uh, Chinese medicine, right? I mean, Chinese still keep using their own uh, traditional way of, uh, of, of medicine, even though there is more westernized medicine. So it's not like they 
adopted it and say, okay, we, we just believe into it. So that, that, what I'm trying to say is there might be some middle grounds mm -hmm. and, and probably some opportunities where both sides can learn from, from each other too, if of course both sides are open to, to learn from each other. But this might not always be the, the case, unfortunately. Well, that's interesting with um, so-called Chinese medicine. There's actually no such thing as Chinese medicine in China. There's just medicine. Uh, and that is the traditional medicine. It's called medicine. And the other in China is Western medicine. So it, it really reverses the perspective. So sure. in the West, there's medicine, which is, is the, the, the modern medicine and Chinese medicine or traditional medicine. No, that's not the thinking at all in China. So yeah, yeah. Um, it really reinforces the extent or shows the extent to how which... Um, uh, traditional knowledge is valued in China because it is seen as being the core knowledge. Yeah, but what is interesting and what we have seen over time, I mean, the World Bank, uh, I mean, at one point called itself a knowledge bank and uh, I mean, other uh, institu institution like uh, um, the Asian development also is, is gearing toward uh, also, uh, I mean, providing some knowledge solutions or being more a knowledge, knowledge bank. And I think, I mean, in, in this big, large uh, development organization, I mean, there has been some effort to try to have South to South kind of uh, knowledge exchange to, so to replicate or duplicate solutions that were developed in, um, in, in the South and, 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 and not have them um, managed by uh, by the north and and shared again for uh, I mean to to other country in the south, but get to these countries to directly interact with each other and and, and share their knowledge. So I'm not sure how successful this uh, this program have been, but I think they are going towards what you're what you're preaching. If I'm if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, we still have uh, two or three more minutes. Any other comments or, or questions? Or um, just responding to uh, there's, there was a sort of request if I, I could put um, the links from the presentation. Uh, there's too many of them to just put the links in. Um, does uh, uh, does the does WhatsApp allow the sharing of the actual PPT? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, we can do that, or you does. can share it with me, and we will share it with uh, with the entire. Okay. Community. Yeah. I, I say yes. if you want to put the PPT in in the WhatsApp group, um, then people can actually just follow the links. Sure. Um, yeah. No. No. For sure. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. We will yeah, do yeah, that, I'll... and I and I will share it also by email from for those who are not yet part of the WhatsApp group, uh, to, so they can also get access to it. And I will share also the link of the recording of today's. So you can, um, anyone who may have missed a part of it or, or missed the beginning of it would be able also to, to catch up. And, and please also share the link of all the, uh, uh, well, I mean, a lot of article you mentioned, you have already the link in the PowerPoint. So I think people will be able to learn more from it. And I think, um, yeah, there has been also in the chat, some of the, well, I think links or also some of your publication or whatever. So they will be also mm -hmm. shared. Great. So, sure. uh, do do you? I mean, since do would you need any help from any of the community member? I mean, is there something that any of the community member could help you with in your in your research? Or is there are there some of you who are here today who would be interested to help or support uh, the work of Bruce and uh, and Sarah and 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 their team? I think it's it's a good opportunity to to get to connect to. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I'd like to help. Paul is raising his right. hand. Yeah, Paul, please. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this um, uh, presentation. But I have a, a very quick question for Bresser, um, or for all of us. My question is, um, how can you be engaged effectively in the in, indigenous and local knowledge, <laughs> as Bresser mentioned? Because um, some of us, we are young people, and Sometimes we intend to engage the, the indigenous for people about the knowledge that they have so that we can use the KM tools and approaches. But sometimes it's very difficult to get some of those information. As a youth, 
or ask the young people, how can we engage effectively in that, in, in the ILK to, to bring it um, more or more to them? I'd actually invite uh, Gladys Kemboy um, to speak on that if Gladys is still here. Um, Gladys? Um, she may have she, yeah, she, No, no, she's here, uh, but I asked her uh, to... Oh, here we go. Uh, sorry, Bruce. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I have a challenge in accessing. So uh, regarding what uh, Paul Atsuit is mentioning is that um, currently Camp for Dev, um, together with the support of the Camp for Dev leadership team, we have the Camp for Dev Young Leaders Forum, uh, professional group. This is for upcoming knowledge managers or people who are interested in knowledge management and we'll be launching the first cohort of the projects um likely september we are working together with ninas and other leadership teams so i will share the link um, feel free to sign up on the key areas for knowledge management that you need support and also um feel free to sign up um, for, me for mentors, or even we are also welcoming those who would like to mentor. So, and we are looking forward on how we can partner also together as we support the uh, young people who are interested in knowledge management. Thank you. Arun, you had your, raised, your hand raised. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm currently writing an application for a grants. Um, it involves um, mining uh, in uh, Rajasthan for cement industry. And um, a lot of these are spread across multiple areas where different indigenous original tribes uh, um, live. So um, if this is quite interesting, we, we have not gone into the mines yet and the application process itself will be another this month and, and uh, then we need to win it. But um, if I get into the mines, then I would definitely like to help boys with the ground data around um, Rajasthan, um, which is a large, largest state in India. So that's um, so I would like to contribute in any which ways I can from this data, data or interviews from the on the ground in Rajasthan. Could you hear us? Bruce, we cannot hear you, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you for, for that perspective there. Um, km for dev has uh, participants uh, in India. Uh, um, Sravidya Harish is one person who comes to mind and she would be a good, very good source of advice on on any such matters um, specifically in regard to um, to India. Um, uh, uh, Servidia is, I know, pretty busy at the moment, um, but uh, she would still, I think, be reachable through uh, through KM for Dev and, and um, if she can't directly help herself, may have uh, uh, other contacts who could, so. Mm. Yep. Great, thank you, Arun. Thank you very, very much, Bruce, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, and please, let's continue the conversation through the WhatsApp group or, or, or whatever uh, link you, you want to have. And um, I'm sure Bruce would be happy also to connect with you for LinkedIn or, or by email or whatever uh, yeah. Yeah, medium so you, you want. Yes. And, yes. and thanks, thanks very much uh, to uh, Vincent and uh, Mariah. <laughs> Uh, and KMGN for the opportunity to be able to do this. And, and yeah, looking uh, very, very much looking forward to uh, continued collaboration and engagement. So, sure. Thank you. And we wish you uh, all the best for your PhD. But it looks like it's in a, a very, very good uh, hands and also in a very, very good stage. So I have no doubt uh, you will succeed and rapidly succeed. So all the, all the best. Thanks Great. So. Much. You're most welcome. So we will uh, very soon also uh, send you the schedule for the upcoming uh, uh, meetings. Uh, usually we try to have a meeting every month, usually on Wednesday or Thursday, but we will send you rapidly by email uh, the upcoming uh, meeting and the upcoming speakers. If any of you 
is interested to share their research in progress at any stage, uh, please uh, be in touch with uh, Moria or myself, and we will be happy to, to schedule you as uh, one of our future speakers. Please do not hesitate. It doesn't have to be finalized. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, and, 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 and let's use also this community as a way to provide you feedback if, if needed or share opinions. I think that's what we are all, uh, all interested to, to be part of. Great. I wish you all a, a great day or a good night and looking forward to see you again next uh, next month. Bye bye. Take Thank care. You, Thank and you, good morning to our friends from US and uh, from Canada. Yes. Brazil. <laughs> see you soon. Thank you all. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Everything. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. bye. Just saving the chat. <laughs> I'll read later. So. Yeah, sure. Mm. Or we might be able to send it to you too. Um, oh, okay. But 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 if you yeah, feel free to uh, to save it. So